All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started in a few minutes here with the image of God. Uh, so I'll let everybody take a minute to find your seats. There are handouts in the back, as usual, if you want to grab one of those. I uh, encourage you to do so. And uh, so in just a couple minutes, I'll pray for us and we'll get started. But let me also mention in the meantime that there is uh, a question up on the board and there's uh, on the uh, screen rather. And there's a uh, QR code as well as a link there. Uh, if you scan that QR code, it will take you to somewhere online where you can answer that question. And um, so if you want to take a minute to answer that question, that's I'll base a lot of our discussion next time on uh, the questions that I receive um, in the coming week or so. Uh, all right. And uh, if you want to turn in the Bible to uh, Genesis 3, that's where we'll be uh, hanging out today. Okay, let me go ahead and pray for us, and then I'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for um, the truth that we are made in the image of God. We thank you for one another uh, as such, and uh, we thank you for all that your word tells us. Uh, as we look at Genesis 3 this morning, we pray that you would help us to understand uh, exactly uh, what the consequences of sin are, uh, where we have gone wrong, what has happened to your image in us as a result, and um, how, how we can grasp for you and, um, and return to you and and conform to your image again after all of this. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, so to, uh, to start out, and let me just recap a little bit of what we've talked about in the previous couple weeks. In the previous couple weeks, we have seen that whatever it means to be made in the image of God, it uh, fundamentally means that we reflect God in some way. We reflect God like a mirror. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, we also saw that we, it was God's intention uh, in creation, we saw this in Genesis 1, that we were meant to fill creation with his likeness. So by being made in God's image and then multiplying and filling the earth, we are actually filling creation with God's likeness, in other words, his glory. And we saw last time in particular that um, we do this, Genesis uh, 1 and 2 point to three primary ways in which we do this. Uh, we are made in God's image, meaning that we, uh, we are like him as children. Um, we are God's children, and we bear resemblance to him as children resemble a parent. Uh, we are his royal representatives on earth, acting as stewards and cultivators uh, of his creation. And thirdly, we are his representation within the holy temple of creation. Um, Meant to, meant to illuminate creation as such with his glory. Uh, the problem, though, is that if I'm honest, uh, I, I don't, and, and you know, and I'm assuming this is true for all of us, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like the image of God much of the time. Um, why is that? I mean, if I, if I look at these three things that we talked about last week, uh, I know intellectually, I know um, as a matter of doctrine, and I know as a matter of scripture that I am a child of God, uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, practically, it can be difficult to feel that I actually resemble him as a child resembles their parent. Uh, even less do I feel like his royal representative, um, and, uh, and still less, least of all, do I feel like I uh, somehow represent him um, uh, or, or fill creation with his glory. And so why is this? And well, the reason is that the fact that we are made in the image of God is, of course, only uh, half of the story for us now. That's only half of what explains our identity as human beings. The other half is the fact that we uh, are fallen creatures at this point. Uh, the other half of the story is sin. So um, Nathaniel, if you can transition one slide. Uh, so as John Stott put it, uh, John Stott put this very well, what we are 
our self or personal identity is partly the result of creation, the image of God, and partly the result of the fall, the image defaced. And so where we stand as human beings now is caught between these two realities of being made in the image of God and the fact that that image has been defaced um, through the reality of sin and the fall. Uh, so what we'll do is look at what we want to do today is look at exactly what it is that happens in the fall in Genesis 3 and particularly how that affects the image of God and, um, and what the consequences of that have been for, for us now. So let's start out looking at Genesis 3 and we'll look at the, uh, we'll start with the first seven verses there. Um, uh, if you can switch one slide, thanks. Um, let me just read the first four verses for us actually and we'll pause there for a second. Genesis 3, one through four reads, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will, you will not surely die. Uh, let me pause right there. As we see here, um, actually, never mind, I'm going to read the next three verses as well. Um, just makes more sense. Verse 5, uh, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they, so and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, so let me back up now. Um, one of the things that we see here in these seven verses is that part of the nature of what happens in the fall, it begins um, with a direct assault on the word of God. If we compare uh, Genesis 2, 17 with Genesis 3, 4, um, that should be on the next slide. Um, and so if we compare Genesis 2:17 with Genesis 3:4, uh, we'll see here that what the serpent says to Eve is uh, literally the direct opposite of what God said to Eve in Genesis 2:17. In Genesis 2:17, God says, "But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die." But the serpent said to the woman, "You will not surely die." Um, directly counter to what God has said. So the fall begins with a direct assault on the word of God, in a, in a sense, calling God a liar. Uh, and that puts into perspective that what happens next um, with the fall, the, the sin that is committed, involves on one level fundamentally disbelieving God, disbelieving uh, what God has said. Um, the second thing to recognize in uh, this passage, uh, if you can switch slides, Nathaniel, um, is in Genesis 3, 5, that a big part of what the serpent holds out to Eve is the, uh, is the promise of being like God. Um, now that's striking in Genesis 3, 5, and this idea of being like God, because if we compare that back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, We'll remember that uh, God did create human beings in his image and likeness. Um, so the language is similar, not identical, but similar. Um, but it seems that uh, part of what is going on here, uh, part of what is meant by being like God uh, in these verses is not just being in the likeness of God. It's, it's not enough here to be in the image of God, but rather being like God in the sense of being equal to him. Um, and we'll see how that plays out in the following verses. Um, but this is, but the, so that's two things, the two preliminaries to begin with in the fall. It begins with a direct assault on the word of God, 
and the promise held out, the, the basic temptation, you might say, to Adam and Eve is to be like God. Um, and it's, it's almost ironic when you consider the fact that they're already made in the image and likeness of God. So what, this, what could this mean to be like God? What temptation could this be if you're already made in the image and likeness of God? We'll see a little bit more in the, in the following verses here, but um, as we parse this out some more, but um, the, another thing to consider here is then is what exactly is the knowledge of good and evil? We first heard of this tree back in Genesis 2, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one and only tree in the garden that Adam and Eve are forbidden to eat from. Um, and, and so what is this? What is this knowledge of good and evil uh, that has been forbidden to them? Um, it's easy to think of it as uh, simply the difference between right and wrong, the ability to tell right from wrong. Um, a sense of ethics or morality, in other words. And if we look at it that way, it would be difficult to understand exactly why this is such a bad thing. Why should they not be able to tell right from wrong? Um, but in reality, it seems that there's actually a lot more at stake than that. There's a lot more going on here than simply the ability to tell right from wrong. Um, there are three verbs used in Genesis 3, 5 through 6 in the Hebrew text that, that really help us realize what's at stake here. Uh, the first is in verse 5. Um, in the English, we translate it knowing, knowing good and evil. In uh, Hebrew, this is coming from the verb yada. Um, and yada means, I mean, to know is an excellent translation of yada, but, um, but it really means to know something experientially, not just to know it intellectually, not just to know it as a fact or um, something like that, but to know it through experience. One illustration of that, in fact, is that um, among the many uses of yada in uh, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, it also happens to be the most, um, the most frequent verb used to describe um, sex. Um, uh, so, so the fact that this, can, this verb can be used to describe uh, sex between a man and a woman to know sexually um, lets you know exactly how um, intimate and, well, experiential the knowledge um, indicated by yada is. This isn't simply intellectual. This is something that you know um, in a much deeper way. Um, the second verb that we see in Genesis 3, 6 is ra'ah, um, uh, translated here saw. Uh, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Um, and, and the thing to realize about ra'ah is that while it does refer to physical sight frequently, uh, throughout Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, beyond 1 through 3 even, um, this persists throughout uh, many of the early chapters, but it also has a metaphorical uh, meaning, which, is, uh, which has to do with evaluation, not just physical sight, but evaluation. Um, and so, for instance, one great example of this is that uh, throughout Genesis 1, every time we read that God saw that such and such was good, um, it, the, the verb being used there is ra'ah. And, uh, and it seems that God is not just observing that something is good when he sees that it is good throughout Genesis 1. He's pronouncing it good. Uh, he is giving his evaluation of his creation, um, pronouncing that it is indeed good. And uh, so part of what seems to be at stake here is not just seeing in, in a physical sense, but also evaluating uh, for oneself. Uh, so, knowing experientially, uh, evaluating for oneself, and then the third verb, uh, sakal, um, refers to uh, deeper insight, translated here, uh, to make one wise. Uh, to make wise is really one verb in the Hebrew text, and that is sakal, and it refers to having some sort of deep insight. And so, uh, together, these three verbs in Genesis 3, 5 through 6, uh, really do help us realize exactly what's at stake in um, acquiring the knowledge of good and evil. This idea of knowing experientially, 
what is good and what is evil, evaluating for oneself what is good and what is evil, and uh, finally having some deeper insight. Um, and when we put it all together, what we start to realize here is the what is at issue is not just intelligence or consciousness. It's not like Adam and Eve were, were dumb beforehand, um, and this is where they gain consciousness or where they you know, uh, gain um, more than animal intelligence. Um, this isn't simply where they uh, gain you know, some sort of um, moral instinct or something, um, but what's really uh, at stake here is autonomy. Um, it's the ability to determine good and evil for oneself apart from God. And that is the problem right there. Going back to Genesis 1, we saw that one of the fundamental truths of being made in the image of God is that uh, we actually can't define ourselves apart from God. If, if, if the most fundamental truth about us is that we are made in God's image, well, just like a reflection in a mirror or a picture that someone has painted or a photograph, uh, the meaning of an image is derived from the thing that it is an image of. A reflection in a mirror takes its meaning, takes its substance from the thing that it reflects. Our, our meaning um, uh, can't be independent of God. And here, that is precisely what they are ultimately striving for, is a kind of independence from God. Um, uh, a, a sort of autonomy the ability, not, not just the ability, but to, to know intellectually, but the ability to um, evaluate, to determine what is good and what is evil for themselves. Um, that, you can see, ties directly back into how the fall begins with the direct assault on the Word of God. It began with, in essence, calling God a liar, doubting what God had said, the truth of what God had said. And the temptation itself involves um, this idea of knowing better than God. Uh, I mean, you can take that a step further. If it's, if it's a temptation to determine good and evil for ourselves, independent of God, then um, the implication is that at least potentially we might know better. Um, and uh, so that is um, that seems to be the real essence of what is what is what is at stake here in the knowledge of good and evil, and from that perspective, it becomes obvious why it is such a forbidden thing. Um, that it's not uh, not just um, telling the difference between right and wrong, but determining for oneself, independent of God, what is right and what is wrong. Um, and so, as many theologians throughout history have realized, if you play all of this out, what's really um, the bottom line here is that this is tantamount to trying to be God. This is assuming God's own prerogative for ourselves. Um, anytime uh, someone tries to pronounce what is good and what is evil for themselves independent of God, they're really assuming God's own prerogative. Um, and so you could sum the fall up in these verses as saying uh, that in essence the image of God here makes a bid to be more than an image, uh, makes a bid to be more than a representative, um, but rather to be like God in the sense of being just like him or equal to him. Um, and, uh, and so the distinction is extremely important. Um, like God sounds a lot like image and likeness of God, uh, but there's a crucial difference. Um, and uh, the difference is that uh, whereas the image and likeness of God may reflect God, um, now the reflection is in essence trying to step out of the mirror and step right alongside God. Um, and, and that will not do. Um, and so, uh, the, the, here's, in, and here's where things get particularly interesting in verse 7. Um, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, so what happens? What's the consequence of this, the immediate consequence? We read in verse 7, Then the eyes of both were opened, 
and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Um, so the minute that they eat the fruit, the first thing that we read is that their eyes were opened. Um, and uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, interestingly enough, this was actually stereotypical language that was used in idol ceremonies, the sort of ceremonies where idols were deified. So uh, typically, in a pagan culture, cultures that used idols, an idol was a physical representation of a god, but it was also thought to be divine. There was, and there was usually a ceremony involved where um, the, the object was you know, thought to be transformed from a mere object to an actual divine being. Um, and the language typically used in such ceremonies in multiple cultures surrounding ancient Israel is their eyes, and was, was that the idol's eyes were opened, the opening of the eyes, the opening of the eyes uh, in these uh, ancient ceremonies typically um, refers to that moment when the image becomes divine. Um, Genesis 3, 7, however, is turning that idea on its head. It's flipping the script in a really serious way uh, because instead of becoming divine, um, instead of becoming like God, um, you know, uh, what we read here is that, uh, what do they learn? What, what's, what's the actual consequence? They, they see, uh, they know that they are naked. Um, and uh, this, this word in Hebrew, erim, uh, has connotations, you know, on the one hand, yes, can refer to physical nakedness. On the other, on the other hand, this same word can be used to refer to emptiness, barrenness, and shame. And so you can think of it, uh, their acquisition, whatever they actually gain um, in, uh, from, from eating this fruit is a sort of negative acquisition. Uh, the knowledge that they gain has negative value, entirely negative. Instead of um, becoming like God, they have actually become diminished. Um, they have now realized a whole sort of, a, a sort of shame, a sort of barrenness, a sort of emptiness. Um, they've been diminished. And, um, you know, and, and I think the text is, uh, the, the writer of Genesis is really, in, is really intending for us to grasp this and playing with this a little bit, even in the wording of the text. Um, you, you expect to read, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew, based on what we've seen up to this point, what we're expecting is, uh, they knew good and evil, or you know, and they knew good and evil like God. Um, that's not what we read. Instead, we read, uh, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So on the one hand, we can see here, uh, and this is uh, one of the authors that I referred to um, last week, Catherine McDowell, um, illuminates this a lot in her dissertation on Genesis 1 through 3. But part of what we can see here is that if there is a comparison between what Genesis means by image when it describes human beings made in the image of God, if there's a comparison between that and the language of image for idols elsewhere in the Old Testament and throughout the ancient Near East, um, then, then the, the big twist in Genesis 1 and 3 is that uh, here the image uh, does not become divine and was never meant to become divine, and it's precisely when it tries to that everything goes south, um, and the reverse happens. Um, and so Genesis 1 through 3 really is turning those pagan narratives on their heads. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's, it's striking here that um, the Again, um, I, I don't think this can be emphasized enough that what Adam and Eve actually come into, what they gain, if you can even call it a gain, um, is, is entirely negative. Um, so, uh, so going on then, uh, what are some of the consequences of this? Um, here we'll flip forward to Genesis 3, 14 through 19. Um, the consequences of the fall. The consequences of the fall are kind of summed up in the curse. Um, and so, 
Uh, I'll, let's see, Nathaniel, can you transition to one? Thanks. Um, so I'll skip 14 for now. Um, that's where God is speaking to the serpent. But let's see exactly what, let's look first at exactly what he says to the woman and the man. Um, to Eve in uh, 3.16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Among other things in this verse, one of the things that, has, uh, that is apparently distorted and twisted now is, is human kinship, the very relationship between husband and wife. Uh, and there's a lot of debate um, about exactly how to interpret um, Genesis 3.16, but it seems clear, um, even by virtue of the fact that this is part of a curse, um, that whatever is being described here is not good, not the way things were intended to be. Um, and there is some sort of fraught nature between the husband and wife now, um, between uh, the man and the woman. Um, that you know, every, every person who's ever been married since um, could attest to on some level. Um, and so, uh, so our, the, the perfect relationality between us, the kinship that was part of the image, what it means to be made in the image of God has now been distorted. Um, it's not perfect anymore. Um, you could also see uh, some, something similar perhaps in the fact that uh, it is now in pain that, um, that the woman bears children. Uh, that also wasn't originally part of the plan. Um, and uh, and so, so while kinship has not been destroyed, uh, it also involves this, this whole process of being fruitful and multiplying will now involve pain. And um, the most basic human relationship the, that we've seen in Genesis so far, the only one we've seen so far, um, uh, has been distorted. And if we were to flip forward to Genesis 4, we, uh, if we've read Genesis 4 before, we know what's coming next, murder. Um, uh, the murder of one brother by another. Uh, so very quickly we're seeing in Genesis the breakdown of kinship, one of those three aspects of what it means to be made in the image of God. Um, secondly, though, let's look at what God says to Adam in 3, 17 and 18, or really through 19. Um, and to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Um, so Adam is now, one of the second consequences that we see then is that Adam is now at odds, in a, in a sense, with the creation that he was supposed to steward and cultivate. Um, it's not that these things are impossible. It is not impossible to steward God's creation now. It's not impossible to cultivate. Um, but it's not so natural of a process as it should have been, not so easy of a process as it should have been, um, because now the ground will fight him. Um, it will not cooperate. Um, and the work that he performs, the work he was created to do, will now involve pain and toil. Um, and um, and so, so that second aspect, um, uh, we talked a little bit last time about how gardening was actually a common image in the uh, ancient world for kingship. And so relating those two things, if, if what it means to be God's royal representative is to um, steward and cultivate his creation, um, if that was part of our purpose, well here, that too, just like kinship, um, has become a bit twisted. And um, thirdly, um, humans were meant to represent God um, and illuminate creation with his glory. We saw that in Genesis 1. But now, humans, humans now represent God only in a very distorted fashion. And um, in verse 19, we see that we are now subject to death. 
uh, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Um, and in this way, we are uh, fundamentally unlike God. Um, so in seeking to go from image and likeness of God to actually being like God, uh, Genesis 3.19 drives home exactly um, how unlike God we have become as a result, uh, less like him than we ever were before, less like him than we were ever intended to be. And uh, so that's a quick summary, of, as quick as I can run through uh, the first 19 verses of Genesis, and there's obviously a great deal more that we could talk about, but I'm really just trying to focus on the effects to the image of God here. And so one question that can be asked at this point is, do we still even bear the image of God? Um, do we bear the image of God at all anymore? And, and theologians throughout history have asked this question. But as often as it's been asked, most theologians in history have come back and said, and said yes. Um, in the third century, um, Irenaeus um, said it this way. He said, we are still made in the image of God, but we have lost his likeness. Um, another third century church father Hippolytus more or less took the same logic. Um, we, we still are made in his image, but we don't bear his likeness to the extent that we used to. Um, Athanasius uh, later said it this way, I uh, like this one a lot, um, the image of God is defaced like a picture covered in dirt. Um, if you can go on ahead. Um, I have here, and I don't know how well this shows up, but on the left, a, uh, a Renaissance painting that is in the process of restoration. And so you can see half of it restored there and half of it unrestored. Um, and if that colorful, vibrant image, the restored portion on the right, um, represents um, what we were meant to be as the image of God and what we could be, um, again, through Christ, um, the faded side um, is perhaps one way of thinking about where we are now as defaced images of God. Uh, on the right, I have a mirror there that doesn't show up very well, but that image is, uh, is of a mirror covered in dirt, and um, it's not reflecting anything, uh, not really, not very well. Um, so this was Athanasius's way of describing it. We were, we're like a picture covered in dirt. We, stare, we still bear the image of God, but it's covered underneath a lot of dirt, and it's hard to see that image. Um, Gregory of Nyssa likened the fall to a sickness uh, that has weakened us um, precisely in relation to the good, uh, specifically in relation to the good. We have become weakened in relation to goodness. Uh, so this kind of reflects the idea again that what we gained in the fall was evil. Um, so it was an, a negative gain, in other words, a loss. Um, we, we already actually knew good, if you think about it. We didn't gain knowledge of good. We knew good, we knew good through God himself and through his good creation. Everything that God created was good. So we never really gained any knowledge of goodness. What we gained was a knowledge of evil. Um, and, uh, and now, as a result of the fall, we are weakened in our, um, in our relationship to God and to his creation, and, and weakened in our knowledge of both. Um, we're enhanced in our knowledge of evil. Um, and so, so Gregory of Nyssa described the fall as a sickness that has weakened us specifically in relation to the good. Augustine, um, uh, early on in, in his work on Genesis, uh, initially came close to saying that the image of God was lost in the fall, um, but later um, he, uh, in, in a work called Retractions, toward the end of his life, Augustine actually published a work that was just correcting all the things that he thought he, thought he got wrong earlier. Um, I think that might be a good idea. Maybe that'll be my last thing that I write. Um, the, um, anyway, um, it, it, later he clarified that the image of God was not entirely lost, um, but rather deformed, enslaved um, to sin uh, or defaced. Um, and uh, he says something similar in City of God. Uh, Calvin seems to have taken a very similar view to Augustine. Um, and um, there are a couple quotes here that are, 
worth. Let me uh, try to pull these up real quick. Okay. Um, so early on, uh, in one in one instance, uh, Calvin says, um, "This is a quote: Because we are corrupted in Adam and are altogether accursed, sin dominates to such a degree that this image of God has been obliterated. The understanding we imagine we have is but stupidity. Our hearts are perverted, and all is rebellion. And in view of this, we do not deserve to be regarded or accepted as people." Um, so among other things there, he says the image of God has been obliterated. If we just took that passage from Calvin, it looks like he says that the image of God has actually been destroyed as a result of the fall and we no longer bear it. But um, elsewhere he clarifies, and that's not exactly what he means, in another work, um, his commentary on Genesis, he says um, that... Uh, he, he uh, objects to the idea that the image has been obliterated in us and says that um, uh, instead some remainder of it is always there to such a degree that the dignity and excellence of man are far from insignificant. And to this he added, however much man may be corrupted, the heavenly creator always keeps before himself the goal of his creation. In other words, sin cannot overpower um, uh, God's will in creation and um, cannot overpower or completely destroy uh, what God has ordained. God created us in, the image of, uh, in his image and not even the fall, not even sin, has the power to destroy that reality. So, so Calvin, uh, like Augustine, says um, that yes, it's been, the image has been obscured, it's been defaced, um, but it's not completely destroyed. Um, and so ultimately, Scripture seems to clearly state that we do still bear the image of God. Um, if you can switch slides. Thanks. Uh, Genesis 9, 6. So this is after the flood. And here, uh, following the flood, God sort of reiterates what he originally said in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, um, when he says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Um, so God is laying down this prescription, this law sort of that, um, that whoever um, murders, um, his blood will be required of him um, because in essence, uh, he has assaulted the image of God um, in assaulting another human being. Um, and so by that logic, obviously, uh, God still regards man as created in his image, just as in Genesis 1. Um, and so ultimately, we don't find many theologians in history that would actually say that we've lost the image of God. Uh, almost all say that the image has been defaced in the fall, and scripture seems to clearly support that. Um, so where does this leave us? Uh, there are a few implications, among others, that we could talk about, but um, I've listed a few here. One is that our very nature is broken, and so is the DNA of creation itself. Um, as the image bearers go, so creation goes. And um, Romans 8, 19 through 21, I won't turn there right now, but um, reflects on that as well. So our very nature is broken, and so is that of creation. Um, as a result, we can no longer assume that how we are is how we were meant to be, or that uh, what is is what should be. Um, if it weren't for the fall, then maybe we could assume that. Um, and so, but now we can't. And so often we may hear people ask, you know, why, um, why about certain issues? Why did God create me this way? Why? Um, why this and why that? And one, and one thing that has to be taken into account there is the fall. Um, how you were born is not necessarily how you were meant to be um, because there's another reality in there now, the fall. Um, and so this is what I uh, will refer to as the born this way fallacy, a, a, a reference to a Lady Gaga song. Um, and um, I, as I, I, I used to, I do this once in a while, I'll listen to... Um, pop songs on the radio and have like philosophical debates with them in my head. And 
Um, and uh, and if anyone has heard that song, and I'm not recommending that you should, um, but if anyone has, uh, the whole real message of the song is that however you are, whatever you are, um, is, is obviously fine because you were born this way. And she even invokes God's name at one point in all of that. Um, and, uh, and, and the fallacy in that is that there's, there's no theology of the fall in there. Um, you, you can no longer assume that um, because you were born this way, you were meant to be born this way. Um, you can no longer assume that your nature is um, innocent, as it were. It's not. Uh, as a result, we also can uh, no longer see God clearly in ourselves or in one another. Um, and instead of illuminating creation with God's glory, we pollute creation uh, with sin. All of this leads us to a place where we are um, in desperate need of a redeemer. Um, one of the results of the fall is that we cannot possibly fulfill what we were meant to be or do as the image of God now, not without help. And, um, and this is important because when we go back to what it means to be made in the image of God, kinship, uh, royal representatives of God, being God's representation in his holy temple of creation, all these things, um, uh, if it, if it makes us, if it feels like a burden to us uh, when we hear those things, like, I don't know how I can live up to that. Um, well, there's a reason why you can't live up to it. Um, not now. Um, not without help. And so we are in desperate need of a redeemer. And um, I think I'll be able to switch slides. Fortunately, even in Genesis 3, God has already made provision for that. Part of the curse to the serpent, not to us. Um, spoken to the serpent, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Um, called by theologians throughout history, the Proto-Evangelium, the, uh, the first gospel, the first announcement of Christ, first promise of Christ, Christ in, in scripture. Already here, God has made provision for that redemption. Um, and as we've seen, some of the image of God does remain in us uh, beneath the dirt. It is not extinguished. Uh, sin is not greater than God and does not have the power to completely destroy the goodness of his creation, um, even though it is twisted now. Um, and so to quote John Stott once more, uh, we must be true... Uh, oh, I actually misprinted that, but that should say we must be true to our true self and false to our false self. Um, but to do this, it will take nothing, nothing less than God incarnate, Jesus Christ, uh, to return us to our true selves. Um, and so that's where I will leave us. And I'm sorry, I left us two minutes for questions, but there's time for maybe one if someone has one. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so the question for anyone who didn't hear it, um, was did Adam have a conception of death? What, or what was his conception of death before um, all of this happened? And um, is that a good summary of the question? Um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, Scripture doesn't tell us, and it's hard to, hard to guess, but I would have to think, I mean, my assumption would be that he couldn't have fully conceived of what death would mean um, because there had never been any such thing. And um, so I don't know how he possibly could have. And, um, and, and yeah, um, he, was, he was warned, um, you know, but um, I think many times we are warned by God in the same way that parents may warn their children of consequences of their actions, and the consequences are rarely understood until they actually hit. Um, and that's probably what happens here. 
Um, okay, uh, I really do have to end here because it's 11.15, so I'm sorry, I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better and leave more time for questions. Um, but uh, feel free to email me with any questions. And next week, I do want to have, um, I, I really want the whole class to be largely discussion. And uh, so send your questions in to me um, ahead of time, and I can uh, help address those. And we can also do a lot of Q&A within the session next week as well. So thank you all.